Okay, um, my name is Michael Hopkins. I've been in the Spinnaker Group for about four years now. Um, I do a few different things, but one of the things I do is the kind of mathematics on Spinnaker and implement the computation of certain things that are maybe more than, more than simple to do, more, some of the more complex things. And I'm going to talk about how to do mathematics uh, using the fixed point algorithms on Spinnaker today. Um, as you're probably aware, um, Spinnaker doesn't have a hardware floating point unit. So you can use floating point, and um, you still do in many cases. There are certain algorithms you'll always need it for. But it's going to be much slower. It, the code size is going to be bigger. And it's going to use more energy. So if you can use fixed point maths, it's always best to, on, at least on Spinnaker 1. OK, so I'm just going to talk, first of all, about numerical calculation on Spinnaker in general. Um, then a little bit about these, uh, a, a draft where it's actually now a stand ISO standard for fixed point mathematics. Uh, give a simple example. I'm going to talk a bit about the considerations, which are some constraints and things you have to bear in mind when you are doing this. Um, some of the libraries that we've developed to make it easier for you to use fixed point arithmetic. Um, give a quick example using the libraries, a little bit more complex. Talk a little bit about how to solve ODEs, uh, ordinary differential equations, which if you're um, building neural models, typically you're going to be solving ODEs in most cases. And then a little bit about the future directions where we think this is going. OK, so as I just mentioned, there's no floating point hardware on Spinnaker. This is a decision made um, initially really to save energy. Um, it would have bumped up the energy budget on the chip quite significantly if we'd had floating point hardware on there. Um, so, for those of you who do a lot of mathematics, um, when I first came here, I was used to having floating point. I was appalled that I couldn't use floating point on Spinnaker easily, because I thought, how can you do any computation without floating point? Um, it turns out you can do quite a lot, but it usually does give you some headache here or there, either in the error of the calculation or functions unavailable or whatever. But what I'm hoping to show today is that you can do quite a lot of interesting maths without the floating point hardware. Some things you'll always need floating point for, linear algebra, for example, um, and the more complex neuron models, almost certainly you're always going to have to use floating point. Uh, with Spinnaker 2 coming along, this will have um, hard fl single precision floating point hardware. So this, this will no longer be an issue, although it'll still be advantageous to use fixed point for energy uh, saving use, uh, energy saving, for example. Um, and it's still worth using if you don't need to use floating point. It still saves you energy and is quicker and easier to do. OK, so as I said, you can use software floating point. It's available just like in any other um, <coughs> environment, but it is software. So it's going to be a lot slower. Typically, float, single precision float is about six times slower than a fixed point calculation, and double precision is typically about ten times slower. It does depend on the operations you're doing, but that's a kind of a approximate rule of thumb. And you'll also have larger binaries because it'll have to pull in some software uh, floating point libraries. And on Spinnaker, as I think you've been told, the, the code space is limited to 32K. So, and for any substantial algorithms, you can actually get quite close to 32K. So sometimes this can actually stop you doing something. You can't fit the code anymore into the, into the uh, code space. OK, and I say until recently, probably that was true a few years ago. Um, people were doing a lot of hand-coded fixed point types to try and make <coughs> things work on Spinnaker, um, taking, trying to, in advance, decide how big a range any variable would be, and then choose a fixed point type which maximized the 32-bit the uh, precision over that range. Um, unfortunately, it isn't transparent for people who are not used to doing this. Each type is hand-coded, custom designed for a particular purpose. Um, it's not easy for people to, if, if you come from a background which is not computer IT hardware design, if you're a biologist or a mathematician or a statistician or someone who's just used to dealing with numbers, you don't also want to have to deal with manipulating a non-intuitive API for fixed point numbers. Um, and so this, many people found this difficult. It also used to produce mysterious bugs, which is, again, something that you don't really want. Um, so although we got 
some benefit with this. One of our projects was much longer than it should have been because basically there were hidden bugs in the fixed point libraries which no one could find, or in the fixed point representations and arithmetic no one could find because of this approach. And it's quite common. As a software engineer, you don't want this sort of thing. You want stuff to be made so it's easy to use and easy to do new ideas. So, um, of course, if you've got an algorithm, you want to take the algorithm which is written in some pseudocode or some other language and then translate it as easily as possible. And this made it difficult. Th these, these fixed point types that were custom made it very difficult to do that. A lot of considerations to think about. So, um, a few years ago it was a draft. Now I think it's an official standard. 18037 um, is actually for defining certain fixed point types and operations on them which you can then use within ANSI C as straight as if it's a, a built-in type. Effectively, it gives you a new library and a new header, and you can now use fixed point types almost transparently. And I'll show you some examples here. It's almost like you're doing it with a floating point. OK, so um, it's a standard for fixed point types and operations, just as if they were integer or floating point types in, in C. Um, it's only available on the GNU tool chain. I don't think it's available on ARM yet, although if it's an ISO standard, it should become available on ARM. Do you know about that, Andrew, at all, whether it's going to be? Uh, no, I don't Not yet, but it, it probably will do. As it's an ISO standard, sooner or later, people, more people will implement it, I suspect. Um, it offers 8, 16, 32, and 64-bit types, and these types are available in saturated or unsaturated, and they're available in signed and unsigned versions. So it's a pretty comprehensive range of types it gives you. Um, the type that we've chosen as our default type, if you like, like our real type, um, is called a cube in the ISO standard. And it's a 32-bit type. Uh, it's a signed 16.15 or an unsigned 16.16. This means it's got 16 integer Sinting bits of integer on the left of the decimal place, and then either 15 or 16 bits of fraction on the right of the decimal place. And so this is our kind of default standard. It fits well into the uh, ARM architecture, and the operations are very fast on this type. Uh, the other type that we use m extensively, although not as much, is called the fract type. And this is um, the standard fract is 16 bits in 0 to 1, so it basically represents a fraction. Um, and again, you've got a signed type, which has got 15 bits of fraction, or an unsigned type, which has got 16 bits of fraction. Um, actually, in real use, the long fract type, which is the 32-bit version of this, is actually more useful, because it, it's, you can build some macros so that multiplies and additions and such are very easy. And of course, it's got twice the precision. And these are the operations that are supported. So it's really pretty well the full set of operations you'd expect from any any type in, in C. Um, I won't go through those, but you can see basically all the arithmetic and shift and relational operators are available. And conversions to integer and floating point and fixed point types automatically. So you can convert between all the types without any problems as well. So it basically gives you a new, um, a new dimension of types that you can use and not have to think about the mechanics of how they work. Um, and you just use them as if they were integers or, or floats. And here's a simple example. Um, so you have to include standard fix.h. This is the header for these types. Um, I've just defined, this is, this is to show, it's quite a useful if you're, if you're trying different types out on a code base. Right at the start of the code, in one of the headers that everything in includes, you would maybe define a real type, and in this case, call it in the queue. This is just a handy macro, which I'll talk a little bit about in a while. When you make a new constant, K is the postfix operator for an acume type. So whenever you make a constant, if you want to avoid pulling in the libraries, don't, don't just give it 100 point naught, make it a real const, 100 point naught, whatever, and it'll guarantee that it's actually an acume type. Otherwise, the compiler will bring in unnecessary, it'll make it a double precision, then it'll convert it to an acume type afterwards, which is wastes space and it wastes time. Um, so by doing these, you can now use real everywhere and real constant. Everything is done automatically as an acume. But if you decided to change it, you wanted to make a long acume, and this could be a huge code base, you would just change that to final real long acume, 
I can't remember what the longer queue type is. I guess it's LK. I'm not quite sure what it is here. But anyway, you change these two, and then the whole code base would automatically change to the new type. So this is very useful for people who are looking at the impact of precision or the types on the accuracy or the speed of operations, for example. Something I recommend if you're going to use these is to have a really disciplined approach to um, defining the types early, and then the whole code base will just automatically recompile with all the appropriate types and constants in it. So what this does is it just generates three accumes. The last one is given a value. This is just it's the same thing, but uh, it's given a different value. You just do a loop. You can multiply uh, A, the accume, becomes an integer times uh, a constant. B becomes A minus the integer. You can test if A is greater than D. You can add. You can take minus equals. You can just do all the normal um, C stuff. And importantly, we've got a thing called IO printf, which is obviously the kind of printing to terminal or printing to buffer. And you can actually get the values out. This is very crucial for the kind of debugging that I do for my code. Uh, typically, you would do this to IO buff, actually. You send this two places you can send the IO printf. Either it comes to the terminal, but more usefully, you send it to a buffer and then look at the buffer afterwards. And then that'll, that'll fill with all your output. And you can print out the values. So you can see, you can use these types as if exactly as if they were normal C types without really any consideration at all. OK, but there are some things you have to bear in mind. <laughs> OK, so that's the good side of the story, is that you can do that and not have to think about anything, and it just works, right? Some things to bear in mind. For an acume type, which is typically what you might be using, a signed acume, S16.15, it can't go smaller than this value, and it can't go larger than that value. So anything outside of that range, and you'll be in trouble. Something bad will happen. I, if you go smaller than this, I suspect it'll go to zero. And then it might even, does it wrap around? Does it, I don't know, I'm not sure. Probably, it certainly it wraps around if you go bigger than this. I suspect it wraps around if you go smaller than that, or it goes to zero for sure anyway. So the range, this is one of the biggest problems when you're using it in real algorithms. This is one reason why you can't use it for linear algebra, for example. The range is very limited. So you have to be very sure of the range of the variables you're going to use if you're going to use these types. If it goes outside of that range, you'll get into trouble, basically. Of course, the 64-bit type is much better. It's got a much more, if, it, if it's an S32.31, of course, it's got a much bigger range. But it's still a finite range. It's still a much smaller range than uh, even the single precision floating point would be. So it's something you have to bear in mind, the, the, uh, the range and the precision of the variables you're going to work with. You don't usually have to worry about that too much of floating point, apart from in very extreme circumstances. Um, you still need to avoid divides in loops. On the ARM architecture, there's no divide instruction, and they're really, really slow. So if you need to divide something, calculate 1 over what it is and multiply by it. Uh, I know you can't always do that. Not all algorithms allow you to do that. But or don't divide unless you absolutely have to on ARM, at least not in a loop. You could divide somewhere as a constant. Um, the, sac the saturated type, so you could have a saturated acume. Um, now, that can't overflow, and it can't wrap. It'll, it'll behave um, much more sensibly. But they are significantly slower. They're almost as slow as doing it with floating point. So unless you may want to do it like when you originally set up the types, you may start off to find real as saturated acume, just to check your algorithm is working but you probably won't use it if in real time in a real in a loop because it's much, much slower. So it's, these are useful perhaps for debugging or getting things off the ground. And if you go from a saturated acume to an acume and something changes in your algorithm or your result, you'll know that you're probably saturating somewhere. Something isn't working. Um, now, this is a subtle point, but it's really something, something no one really talks about. <laughs> But I think I discovered it by, by accident. I didn't discover it, but I rediscovered it by accident when I was doing a paper a few years ago, which is that since the 1960s, really, everyone's been using floating point for mathematics. And people have, I know in some embedded systems, people are still doing things in fixed point, but that's a fairly small, um, a fairly small side of the mathematics, complex mathematics market, if you like. Um, numerical precision in floating point is percentage error. So you expect the error tracks with the size of your value. So whether you're down at a tiny number, whether you're up at a gigantic number, the error is always a kind of constant percentage of the number you're at. That's not the case with fixed point. With fixed point, it's absolute error. 
So down at small numbers, the error is an enormous, is comparatively speaking, relatively much larger. Up at large numbers, the error is comparatively speaking much smaller because it's an absolute error, the smallest value you can represent. So the, the, uh, the values go in steps of this in fixed point. So if this is the value you're trying to represent, the next one up will be twice as big. So you have terrible quantization down at the smallest values. Now, most numerical algorithms, the numerical analysis of most algorithms, almost all algorithms that you see, will be considering in terms of constant percentage error in general. That's the general default position when you're analyzing an algorithm. So when you are looking at guarantees of performance for an ODE solver or some other algorithm which is calculating a derivative, for example, of a function, if it's making that assumption and this number is very small, the fixed point will give you very different behavior from the floating point. So this is something to bear in mind. If, you're, if an algorithm isn't doing what you expect it to do, but you're not out overranging anywhere, it's almost certainly this is the issue that's causing you the problems. It's, uh, it's a subtle thing, but it is definitely something you have to bear in mind. Um, yes, I've already mentioned the real const. You, you don't need to use this, but it just mean, means the code is tighter. It doesn't pull in the, the libraries you don't need. Because if you define a, a variable in C by default, it's defined if it's, a if it's got a decimal, it's defined as a double by default. By using this, you can avoid doing that. And it doesn't have to pull any libraries in when it, when it makes the code. Uh, you need to include, obviously, standard fix.h. That's the, the header that's required for where all these types are defined. And I think I've already mentioned this. You, if you use real and real const right at the top of your code base as a header that everything includes, then you can actually, and I've been doing this recently, and I did it a few years ago for the, for the um, neuron, the ODE solver paper, you can actually take quite a large amount of code, and just by changing in one place, everything will recompile for the new type, and you can compare algorithms and entire programs quite easily across the types and, and start to make, um, start to realize what you're losing or gaining by changing types very, very easily. Yes, I think I've already mentioned that. Um, real const deals with most of that, all the suffixes if you're using things elsewhere. Okay, so as well as so that's the draft library itself, or the library, uh, the, the uh, actual standard now, which is available um, in the ARM cross-compiler. Um, but we realized quite early on that you're going to need to do a lot of stuff. You're going to need a lot of support with that. It doesn't have, for example, transcendental functions and various other things that you're going to need to do real maths. So we set about doing, setting up some libraries that are going to um, allow you to do some of the things that everyone wants to do when they're doing computation. And I'm going to talk first about uh, the ones that I've been most involved with. Um, and this uh, is the set, it's still called random.h, isn't it? Is it it's, uh, Andrew? Yeah, 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 sorry. <laughs> it had a different name originally, I think we changed it since then, yes. Yeah. So this is a, it's a set of random number, pseudo-random number gener generators for uniform random numbers and for non-uniform random numbers, which obviously is quite useful when you're generating, a lot of people are generating populations with random parameters or random delays or whatever else, so you need to be able to do that sometimes. Um, this provides three very high quality uniform generators, which generate uh, pseudo-random UNT32s according to Massaglia's KISS32 and KISS64 algorithm and LeCoya's WELL1024A algorithm. These are all um, excellent algorithms. They pass, if you can pass a statistical test, they pass the very tough, the toughest tests that are out there, which is Die Hard and Die Harder and the Test U01 test suites. These are probably the toughest algorithms you can find for testing random number generators. They test every single aspect of them you can think about, equidistributional properties, correlations, run tests, everything. Um, and these, uh, these three are some of the very few simple, quick, cheap random number generators that actually pass all the tests. So you can actually, as a pseudo-random number generator, you can rely on these as, as random number generators. Um, they have different cycle lengths, different speeds, different equidistributional properties, but they're all good basically. Um, they're available in both a simple to use form where you don't worry about the seed, you just run it and the seed is taken care of for you. Or if you want control over seeds, which you may often do, like if you're running a parallel program and you want to run a bunch of Markov chains, for example, but you all want them to be different Markov chains, you would set up the same program but give all the random number generators different starting seeds. And then you'd have guaranteed a bunch of parallel. And we've done some mathematics because of the cycle length. I think you can run a a simulation for 15 hours, you can run a million parallel simulations for 15 hours 
and just with a random choice of seeds for the different uh, million processes, you still won't, most likely won't overlap at all anywhere. So at the moment, these are very good for very large, very long-term processes. We can make longer cycle ones quite easily if we want, but for the moment, I think these are going to cover everything that people's needs for at least the next five years or so, we think. Okay, and of course, once you've got uniform pseudorandom number generators, you can now set up some non-uniform ones. And of course, people want Gaussian, they want Poisson, they want exponential, and we, we can actually generate more, and there's always more coming along. So if you want any particular non-uniform random numbers, which we haven't already got in the library, let us know, and we can probably generate them pretty quickly afterwards. Um, sometimes they'll be quite slow. Again, the loss of floating point can be a bit difficult here, but we usually have some tricks. For, um, for example, I think the Poisson uses a, a NUTH algorithm, from bef you know, which is an integer version one. It's not necessarily the fastest, but it's a very good algorithm. So we can usually get something together that works well and test it for you. OK, and another set of libraries in a kind of different way. This is done by uh, Dave Lester. Um, two different things. Um, the first is there are gaps in the GCC implementation of the ISO standard at the moment. And these are mainly um, standardized type conversions. So if you want to make one value the same function as another value, I believe, so Dave tells me, there are, there are things that don't work properly in the current GCC implementation, but he's fixed them. So you can now convert between types reliably and safely. Um, he's put in types, he's put in functions that should be in any kind of fully um, ANSI compliant uh, C compiler, which weren't apparently present for all the types in the GCC implementation. So this is basically tidying up the bits that they left out of the, the, the implementation in GCC. And he's got a mechanism for automatically inferring the right argument types. Um, I don't think we've actually used that much yet, but I think that, that'll, that, that could be useful for various things. Not sure if it's completely reliable, though, uh, yet. I don't know if we've ever used it safely and reliably. I know Dave was using it for some of his stuff, but whether it ever got put into anything, I'm not sure. But it's a good idea to, to have it. It's quite a useful thing to have. It's like a way of avoiding templates, if you like. OK, and this is stuff I asked for, or was desperate for, very early on. Um, th when you're doing mathematics and probability theory and all these things, you need all the, all the transcendental functions. It's, you really can't get away without them in general. So you need x, square root, log, and trig trigonometric functions. Um, and it took quite a while to get there because it's quite difficult to do in floating point, but um, in, in fixed point. But Dave has come up with some very good um, some very good functions. I'm not sure how comprehensive the library is, but I know we've, all, we've got x for sure. I think we've got square root and log. Uh, I'm not sure what the full library is yet, but uh, we, we've, we've got a n number of these on the way, and they're very fast, and they're as accurate as you can get in fixed point for the types he's chosen to look at. So they're bit accurate. I think the last significant bit accurate, and they're very fast. So, of course, a lot of people are going to use exponential in all neural models and things. A lot of synapses, a lot of things within neural models are exponential. So having that available is very handy. And you can use it just like you'd use exp in, in libm, you know, again, so you use it directly on the type. And they're, yeah, they're about 10 to 30 times faster than libm calls. So they're worth using if you're doing maths in fixed point. Okay, so here's an example using the libraries. A little bit more com complicated example. You've got a few different types here. Um, you initialize, this is how you initialize the well generator, which is a very long cycle length um, generator. You need to initialize it before you use it. And then you just go over a loop. You draw R1, is the UN32. You draw it from the generator. So this is now a, a pseudo-random number between naught and max of UN32. You, this is from Dave's library. I haven't put the library headers there because we didn't have room, I'm afraid, but you include the library headers. Uh, this is one of Dave's functions where you convert that uint32 into an unsigned long fract. And it's guaranteed to be safe. Uh, you can draw from a Gaussian distribution using a different generator, which a simple one where you haven't had to touch the seed at all. And you see, because you're not doing anything with the seed, you use a null in the second argument. So this is now a Gaussian, the standard Gaussian value. 
Um, you can multiply something by a value and like the absolute value and log that. So you, you can use this just like you would in any, any normal C code. And again, you draw an exponential variant from a random number generator which you initialized and square root it. And you can e to the cube value of it. So basically, you could, this is, none of this doesn't make any sense and does anything interesting, but you can see how you use the libraries and the calls. They're just like normal C library calls. And then print out, print out the results as usual. OK, now this is um, so a bit more of a concrete example now. Um, if you want to solve, how many people here are interested in neuron models or they want to solve ODEs in some sense on, a, on Spinnaker? One per. I'm surprised it's not more. Two. I'm surprised it's not more than that. Okay, anyway, well, <laughs> so this is for you guys, all right? So, uh, right, well, norm I mean, there are lots of other things where you might want to solve ordinary differential equations as well, but neuron models is a very classic example that most of us in our area think about. Um, now, of course, this is a huge range of problems. For a lift neuron, if it's a current input lift, then it's a closed form solution. There's no, nothing to solve. You just do a multiply and a subtract and a add, and that's it. You've got exactly. Uh, I should probably talk about ODEs a little bit, because maybe not everyone here is used to ODEs. Uh, if, you, if you've got a starting point and you've got a differential equation, what you're trying to do is track the, um, how that equation, the movement of the, of the response you're interested in over time. And it's defined as the differential equation over time. So what you, when you're solving an ODE, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm here at this point, and I know what the differential equation is, given the parameters state of the system. What's, it, what's the value of the response going to be at the next point? And, so, and of course, there are good and bad ways of doing that. Um, for some, like an input, uh, current lift, once you know where you are with the lift you're on, you can, there's a closed form solution. You just do a multiply and a subtract and, a, and an add, and you know exactly what the value will be at the next time point. At the other extreme, you've got things like the Hodgkin-Huxley equation from the original giant squid experiments, which is a very, very complex four-state variable equation where the state variables are themselves a very complex nonlinear function of each other. And it's a very complex equation, and it's very stiff, which means that some of the variables change very, very slowly over time, and other variables change very quickly over time. So there's no real appropriate time step. Whichever time step you choose for one variable is wrong for the other ones, and vice versa. And the Hodgkin-Huxley is very, very tough. Even with full floating point and variable time step and many other things, it's a very tough equation to solve. So the, the range of problems of solving ODEs is from absolutely trivial to almost impossible. And so you'll meet everything in the middle there. Um, and of course, you've got to now calculate you're given that um, you've got your membrane voltage of your neuron at, at time t, and you want to know what it's going to be like at t plus 1, and therefore is it going to spike, for example. That's, that's of, of typically your interest. Now, you've got to make that calculation accurately enough that it doesn't, that you, you have, it's a good representation of what would happen in the actual system, but you can't be too slow about doing it. If you're going to do real time performance, you have to do this quite quickly. So there's always the balance between accuracy and efficiency for these ODE solves. And as, the, as the, the neuron model, I mean, Izikovic is probably the next level of complexity. Then you've got ADEX, which is the next level of complexity again. And then there's a few others until you get up to Hodgkin Huxley. So every time the, the model gets more complex, you've got to think more carefully about accuracy and efficiency. Um, now, and what I claim here is that if you're careful and you attend to the detail, that you can use fixed point for this and therefore get the speed and energy gains from fixed point. Um, although I'm not sure we're ever going to get uh, a really fast, accurate solution to Hodgkin-Huxley with fixed point, for example. That's the ultimate. If we do, then that's marvellous. <laughs> that's, really, that's a real bit engineering marvel if we can get a good fixed point result for uh, Hodgkin-Huxley. But it's going to be tough. It's tough enough even with double precision floating point. So Now, I, I wrote a paper with Steve Ferber in 2015 which is, has quite a lot of detail about the issues and the references for people who've tried this before and trying different things and which things work and which things don't work, and quite a few graphs to make it re relatively easy to digest the information. 
If you're interested in this kind of thing, I recommend you read that. Not because I wrote it, but because I think there's a lot of useful and helpful information in there that will that'll guide you in interesting directions and away from bad directions, if you like. Specifically for fixed point, solving ODEs with fixed point. And we ended up getting pretty good results for Zukovich neuron, which is more complex than LIF, for sure, at real time, because at one millisecond time step, uh, which is probably going out of fashion now, one millisecond time step. I think over time, 0.1 will become the new standard. But at the time that Spinnaker 1 was conceived, one millisecond time step was considered to be the kind of standard default time step, and that's what it was set up for as a real-time system. And so a very brief example of this, um, I won't go into this too much detail because there's not many, that many people here who are interested, but so he here's how you would, you would generate a function which is an updating function. So this is the, H is the time step. This points to a neuron. It's got the state variables and the, and the parameters of the neuron. And this is the input coming in. In this case, it's a current input. So it's positive if it's mostly excitatory or it's negative if it's mostly inhibitory or whatever. Um, you will draw some, va now these reals, remember these are probably accumes in this case. You will ha set up four values. You will draw the values from the neuron pointer, which is the V and the U, two state variables, and two of the def definitions for, the, uh, for that particular neuron, which is if you, how many people here know about the Izakovich neuron or have used it or know what it is? Okay, a few more. So these are the A, B, C, D parameters. Two of these are drawn in here. Now, I'm not going to take time to draw up the equation itself, but the idea of this is um, something I came up with called algebra, um, it's an algebraic reduction of the, ne the, OD the neuron ODE itself and a runge cutter second order ODE solver. Now what came into my mind was that because they're both explicit, you can actually fold them together algebraically and get it, it's, although it's an algorithm, you can actually end up with an algebraic result for the algorithm. And using Mathematica and a lot of fiddling about and playing about, I found there's, there's about 100 different ways you can break this, this combined problem down and you can come up with common variables, draw out the common variables. The trick being that you want to do as few calculations as possible. You want those calculations to be within the range of the fixed point variable that you're interested in and hopefully in the middle or upper range so you're not going down towards the, the, the quantized end and you want it to happen fast. And it's the result of many hours of fiddling about, <laughs> you find that there's one called, I call pre-alpha, which is a simple calculation here. Then you make another sub-variable. You make a, an alpha and an eta. You combine them together in these two. You make another, this could be a fract, by the way. This is always going to be between naught and one. So making it a long fract would actually you'd lose less precision. And then the update to your neuron model. So V at the next time step is the current <laughs> V plus this algebraic uh, com combination of these terms. And the next for this U state variable is updated with this combination of these terms. So you've turned quite a complex algorithm and neuron model into a relatively simple algebraic construction. And you've taken into account how many calculations you have to do. You've made sure that the interim variables are within sensible ranges, which is very important for fixed point. And this, this performs actually very well. Um, it, and so there's quite a lot of work went into that. It doesn't look too much, but there's a lot of messing about and fiddling about to try and get to that stage. But I recommend if you're interested in anything like this, the paper has got a lot more detail about it. But you can see this is all done with fixed point now, just like it's in normal C code. No hand-coded types required. OK, so now just briefly, I want to talk about some maybe future directions that where else you could take this. Um, we, there are some, t there are quite commonly, you'll want to multiply an acume by a long fract. They're both 32-bit types. You'll have a number, which is a general number, and you'll have a number which is guaranteed to be between 0 and 1. And um, Dave, Dave Lester, I believe, has already written a macro which does this much faster. You can just multiply them in the code just like C code. You can take a, an acume and a long fract and the, the, the GNU compiler will do it for you fine and you'll get the right result. But Dave Lester has written a macro which is used some assembler arm assembler magic which does the same thing much, much faster. So if you know you're doing this and it's in a loop, 
although it's less obvious to show, um, it, you know, it's less obvious, it's less transparent to read, I would use Dave's macro rather than just saying multiply A by B. So you go whatever his multiply is called, A comma B. And it'll do the same operation but much faster. And there's, there's scope for doing this in more cases as well. Um, yeah, but what, have I, what have I said here? Add the standard fixed math new types. Oh, yeah, okay, well, we can always use more special functions. I don't think we have pow, for example, power, the power function, pow x, y. It's a really difficult function to do in, in fixed point. Dave started looking at it, but I think he kind of put it on the back burner because he realized it was like a, a PhD on its own. So uh, always useful to have more special functions and transcendental functions in the library because as people start to do more and more maths, you're going to want more of them. Um, we can make more random number generators. I think the ones we have at the moment are ample for most people's purposes, but it's never a problem to build longer cycle random number generators. And of course, more non-uniform distributions. People might want a Weibull distribution, or they might want a t-distribution or something, and we can always add in those, given enough time and a bit of effort, we can, we can just make more new uh, non-uniform distributions in the library. Um, more new libraries entirely, like probability distributions. If people want to do more Bayesian inference, they want to do more probability theory, they want special functions, probability distributions, we can, of course, add all these in um, as, as and when people require them. Um, IO printf, I believe, I don't think we can print out at the moment long fract or unsigned long fract, and I don't think we can print out floating point variables at the moment either because I'm told that the library for IO printf gets bigger and bigger the more variables you add and eventually it starts dominating the, the code size, and, uh, which is obviously a problem. Um, but at the moment, if you want to output one of these, or if you want, want to output a floating point variable, all you do is you convert it to an acume and output the acume instead, which is not ideal, but it gets you by in most cases. Or you can send stuff into a buffer. You can send the raw stuff into a buffer and get it out afterwards and decode it if you really need it. But so we can, add, we can add to IO printf. Maybe there are clever ways of doing that, which, which don't take up so much code size. Um, we could start to add linear algebra operations, although I don't think you're going to want to do too much linear algebra in fixed point in general, because there's so many ways it can go wrong on you. Um, any matrix decompositions, if the, if the condition number of the matrix is, is very large, you have no idea how big the numbers are going to be in the, in the matrix that you decompose, and they're very likely to be outside. One or more of them will be outside the range of your variables. So matrix multiply, matrix by vector multiply, some things like that we might decide to do optimized versions um, because obviously they're used very widely. Things like that may be okay with some range checking, but much beyond that, I think we're probably limited. You probably need to go to floating point when you start to do things like that. Uh, and this is something I recognized when I first came here, and we've actually got a project going now at the moment. Um, Spinnaker architecture is, of course, it's massively parallel by, ne by definition, and there are some algorithms where it's very easy to take advantage of that. Markov Chain Monte Carlo, you set up basically your same... How many people here do any Bayesian inference or use Markov Chain Monte Carlo or anything like that? Okay. Okay. Hooray, we've got one there. <laughs> okay, so... What you want to do is you want to set up random chains and then draw from them over time. But you're drawing a sample from a posterior distribution, but it might be a very complex posterior distribution, so the sample might come very, very slowly. So what you do is you might set up 100,000 chains in parallel, start them all off with different random number seeds, they're all in different, different chains, and then your sample comes 1,000 times as fast, or 100,000 times as fast. So that's a natural mechanism that we could use on Spinnaker. And we're, we're looking into doing that ourselves. In fact, Joanne, who was here yesterday, is the, is the person. I don't think she's here today, is she? No. Um, she's the person who's trying to implement that at the moment. Okay, I think that's it. Is it? Yeah, that's it. Any, any questions, please, for...